Our scripture reading tonight is 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 to 16. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 to 16. Uh, we are going to focus on a particular phrase in that passage, but uh, to get the context, we're going to read those three verses. If you have it open before you, 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 to 16, let us just uh, pray that God would help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to this passage. We thank you for the privilege of looking into your word. We thank you for your intention to sanctify us, to make us holy, to make us beautiful through your truth and that your word is truth. And as we come again to this passage, we pray that we may behold beautiful things from your word. And that you would allow us to uh, see the beauty of our Lord Jesus. And that as we look at him, that we would be changed. And that we would be uh, more beautiful. And that we would become more like him. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So 1 Timothy 3 verse 14 to 16. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. Vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Thus far our reading. Now if you've been to Clearwater Mall and you look a clock across the atrium, that big open space that has the sliding roof where um, the restaurants are, if you go one floor up and look across from the takeaway side, you'll see across the the atrium that there's a, a shop that sells all kinds of electronics but the one thing that you'll see right across the atrium are these huge TVs monster TVs with high definition you can see whatever is on the screen right across from there the thing is if you go closer you discover that that it just becomes as it were more beautiful because the the images and the footage that they have on those on those screens are very colorful and of of beautiful things, uh, sea life and animal life and and uh, probably the Alps and things like that. And uh, so as we come to this passage tonight, this is this passage is somewhat like, like that. Um, we are coming to a really loaded passage and, and the closer you look and the more you stare at it, um, the more beautiful it becomes. And uh, tonight we are going to look at a particular phrase in this passage, <clears throat> which is the phrase vindicated by the Spirit. And I, I hope that you would come close and, and have a look at, at this and find it beautiful. So uh, just some background from verse 15. Uh, if we had to ask, what is the task of the church? Um, we would see that, that the church, uh, the, the task of the church is to display the, the truth. The church is a pillar and a buttress of the truth. And um, Jesus wants the beauty of our godliness to put his excellencies on display. That's, that's what the church needs to do, is, is to proclaim the truth about him, not only in our words, but also uh, by the lives we live. And uh, uh, the truth about him in this passage is called the great mystery of godliness in verse 16. And uh, we've seen previously that this, this mystery uh, is a mystery because it's not always seen for what it is. Um, some people simply never see it. But uh, it, was, it was not always seen. The, the 
truth about Jesus. Uh, but believers can see it. Now, it's the great mystery of godliness. What's the link uh, between uh, knowing the truth, this great mystery of, of Jesus, and godliness? Because it's called the great mystery of godliness. What's the link? The link is that the truth we know and believe about Jesus should change us and does change us to be like Jesus. And we should become godly as we get to know the truth of the Bible, as we get to know the truth about Jesus. That's the plan. Uh, last time, uh, to explain this, uh, we, we looked at, at um, the phrase, He was manifested in the flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. And what does that mean? And how does that uh, mystery or that truth uh, change us? And how does it work godliness? We said uh, the phrase means, he was manifested in the flesh, means that God became man. The creator of the universe humbled himself to appear as a human baby and to grow up to be a carpenter among us. And in the process, he displayed the glorious love and truth of God to us. And there was no other way. He had to humble himself to become a man, and he had to go even lower. Uh, he had to die a, a gruesome death, a death on a cross, in order to save us. And um, that become, became a, a, an illustration of what servanthood really looks like. And uh, in that way, Jesus showed us what godliness looks like. And he practically taught us how to humble uh, ourselves and become servant to one another. So that's how the, the, the mystery and the godliness are linked in, in that phrase. Tonight we're going to look at the phrase, He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was vindicated by the Spirit. <clears throat> now we're going to treat the passage again uh, as we've done before. We're going to ask what, why and how. What does it mean that He was vindicated by the Spirit? Why, why is it important that He was vindicated by the Spirit? And how, how does that phrase... Uh, influence us and apply to us in a very practical way. So, what was vindicated? Why is vindicated important? The vindication of Christ and how does it apply to us? <clears throat> so, we start with what? What does it mean that Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit? What does vindicate mean? Well, to vindicate means to prove that someone is not guilty or someone is free from blame after someone blamed them or even tried to catch them. So somebody is vindicated when they are proven not guilty and when they are free from blame. Now, we love vindication stories. Uh, we love them in the movies. And uh, the Bible also has a long history of vindication stories. Noah was vindicated against the people of his day when eventually his long project of the ark was completed and he was saved, him, he and his family. Jacob was vindicated against Laban who tried to defraud him when God blessed Jacob's labors and uh, increased his flocks. Moses was vindicated against the Egyptian gods by the God of the Bible, destroying all the Egyptian gods. Joseph, Joseph was vindicated uh, in the allegation from Potiphar's wife. Uh, after he had been to prison, he came out and he became a very important man in Egypt. Uh, Daniel was vindicated by God, by, by the fact that God closed the 
uh, mouths of the liars. And um, he, his God was proven the truth, true one. Also, um, the, his friends in, in the, in the uh, furnace of fire were vindicated when God saved them. They said, uh, we will not bow down. And uh, they were vindicated. Uh, Nehemiah was vindicated <clears throat> against Tobiah and Sanballat um, when they said that uh, that wall is never going to be completed. Uh, he, together with the people of Jerusalem, were vindicated in completing that that wall in a record time. Elijah was vindicated on the on the mountain of Carmel when God sent down fire and uh, destroyed the altars by fire. And uh, he was vindicated against the, the uh, Baal prophets, showing that the true God is the God of, of Israel. And um, Joshua was vindicated against the other spies eventually when he, when he said, but it is a, a beautiful country and we can conquer it. Um, it did take a long time. And that's the important thing, that vindication may sometimes take a long time to take place. So those are some of the vindication stories in the Bible. But here we, we see that Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. He was accused of all kinds of things. He was accused of being a false prophet. He was accused of being demon-possessed. He was accused that uh, he's, he's working the miracles by the power of Beelzebub, who was the head of the devils. He was accused of breaking Jewish tradition. He was accused of eating with publicans and sinners. He was accused of healing and working on the Sabbath. And he was accused of making himself equal with God. <clears throat> he was accused falsely, um, uh, or he was accused that he would be falsely claiming to be a prophet and to be God, to be God's son. Um, he was accused that he was falsely claiming that he could forgive sins. And finally, uh, there was this uh, accusation that that he said he would destroy the temple and reconstruct it in three days. So all kinds of accusations came against Jesus. And most of those accusations were born out of jealousy by the religious leaders of the day. But if we look practically, uh, how was Jesus vindicated? Um, how did the Spirit vindicate Jesus. Well, I think the first important one was that he was proven to be who he was through the works that he did. Uh, and he said to the, to the, to the leaders, uh, if I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. Because the works the miracles were, were absolutely clear. Uh, and then you would know that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. So Jesus' miracles vindicated these statements about himself. Uh, Jesus was also vindicated in his trial. And um, uh, in the book of Acts, when Paul was uh, speaking to the people at Pisidian Antioch, he said, and though they found no guilt in him worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. So that was looking back uh, to, to the trial and just commenting that there was no guilt in Jesus. Um, they didn't find any guilt in him. And if we go back to John and read through the story of the trial, you'll find that, that Pilate at least at three occasions, said, I find no guilt in him. So in his trial, the official trial, Pilate could not find any guilt in him. 
But then uh, after he was uh, in the trial and after he was he was um, hanged on the cross, uh, the real vindication of who he was came when he was resurrected. And we read of that in Romans 1, verse 1 to 4. In verse 4 it says that Jesus uh, was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so Paul Paul was saying that the Holy Spirit proved who Jesus was and that these claims about him that he made about himself were true because he was resurrected from the dead. <clears throat> and um, uh, Jesus was also vindicated by the Spirit in that the Holy Spirit came upon the children of God. Because Jesus said it's going to happen. He says uh, in John 17 uh, or 16 verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your adver advantage when I, that I go away. Now, when Jesus said in that passage that I go away, he, mean, he meant it is to your advantage that I die. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In other words, uh, through his death, it made it possible for the Holy Spirit to fill the believers. His death had to take place so that people could be reconciled to God. And in that way, it became possible for God, the Holy Spirit, to come into the lives of believers. If it hadn't taken place, if he hadn't died, um, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come. But Jesus was vindicated when the uh, believers in Jesus were filled by the Holy Spirit and are filled by the Holy Spirit even today. All right, so Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. He was proven to be who he said he was in spite of the lies and the allegations against him. Why is that important? <clears throat> Why is that important? Well, it's important because when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said of Jesus, there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God had allowed lambs as substitutes to bear the punishment of the people for their sins. But here's the important thing, and this is why the vindication is important. These lambs had to be without blemish. When Jesus became the Lamb of God slain for us, He had to be without blemish. He needed to be perfect. He needed to be spotless. He, he needed to be the righteous Lamb of God. And that's why He needed to be vindicated, to be proven to be the one who is without sin. For otherwise, He would not have been uh, in a position to die for us. He would just be in the same boat of us. If He was a sinner like us, then he couldn't die for us. His death would simply be the wages for his sin. And he wouldn't have been resurrected. But that is why it's so important that he was vindicated by the Spirit through the resurrection to prove that he could be the perfect substitute, the perfect Lamb of God that was slain for us, that his death could be applied to us that he was the holy, perfect Lamb of God, the Lamb without blemish. And that's why we sing, Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness. And we continue to sing, God is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And it says why. 
because the sinless Savior died. That's why Jesus had to be vindicated, to be proven to be the Holy One of God, so that He could be the Lamb of God. That take, that took away the sins of the world. Now, how should this inform us? How should this apply to us? That's our third point. How does it work for us? How does the vindication of Jesus apply to to us? Well, in a very practical way, um, the writer of Hebrews in in verse uh, in chapter twelve, verse three, he says, "Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary." Or faint-hearted. We need to consider the, the hostility against Jesus and how he handled that. Because that becomes an inspiration for us to persevere. To not grow weary or faint-hearted. Jesus endured hostility. But eventually he was vindicated. And, and we are called to consider him. Now, Satan's attempts, as we see in the verse, would be to make us grow weary and make us grow faint-hearted. Why? Well, because just maybe if he could get us to get weary as we are facing hostility and get faint-hearted, then perhaps we could be silenced. Then, then perhaps we, should, we would stop to be the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Now, how how would Satan get us to keep quiet? How would he do that? In Revelation 12 verse 10, we see that he is called the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before our God. In a, a, a book called Rules for Radicals, a man by the name of Saul Alinsky that was advising radicals how to undermine society and how to undermine authority. He said that ridicule is man's most potent weapon. I think he took that note right from Satan's Satan's book. That ridicule is man's most potent weapon. In other words, accusation is something that just disables your enemy. False allegations. So in a very practical way, how should we then apply this this um, truth about Jesus' vindication? In the book of, of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter is writing uh, to several groups of people and uh, he makes this this truth very practical when he speaks to slaves uh, in the workplace. Uh, he's using this truth to equip them to handle ill treatment in the workplace. He writes, for what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it uh, and you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So this truth of the vindication of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit should inspire people in the workplace who are treated unfairly to persevere and to respond in a godly manner. 
to respond in a Christ-like manner. It says that Jesus left us an example. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Just think about how Jesus could have, have reacted. When, when he was insulted, could he not have insulted and ridiculed his haters like nobody else could? We know that in the conversation with the Samaritan women, he was able, because he's God, to tell her about a whole life. Did he not know everything about every life of everyone that was insulting him and accusing him falsely? He did. And he could have taken the darkest secrets of everyone that attacked him and turned it in uh, onto them and absolutely destroy them. But yet, when he was reviled, when he was insulted, although he could, he did not revile in return. He could have retaliated, but he did not. And Peter's point is, neither should we. The next phrase is, when he, when he suffered, he did not threaten. Jesus could have threatened when he suffered under his attackers. But he did not retaliate. And when he threatened, it, it would have been a real threat. But when he, when he suffered, he did not threaten. If we want to be like Jesus, neither should we. The lamb who was without blemish was also the lamb who was silent. According to Isaiah, he was the, he was the lamb th that was silent. He could have responded differently, but he didn't. And Peter's point is, we should follow him. We should follow his example in this regard. The next phrase that Peter uses is, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus did not shortcut the process. He could have shortcut the process, but he did not. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In the garden, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. But then he continued to say, Yet not as I would, but as you will. He was basically saying, Father, I trust you. I'm entrusting myself to you. I'm trusting that you are good and that you would do what is right. You are the judge who judges justly. And he was trusting his father in that regard. He was basically saying that court day may not be tomorrow, but the court date is coming. There's no need to rush. There's no need to be desperate for the court day. Because, Father, you judge justly. And would the, would the God of this world who created it, would he do not, not do what is right? And um, therefore, we need to learn from Jesus to trust God who judges justly. And here's the thing. When, when we are accused, sometimes, unlike Jesus, we may be guilty of that sin. And in that case, when that is true of us, we should remember what we are singing. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the judge, the, the, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. So we can be vindicated even when we had been guilty. 
That is a wonderful truth. So tonight we looked at what is the vindication of Jesus. And we said that the vindication of Jesus was simply the fact that he was proven to be who he was. And he was proven to be absolutely sin sinless. And we said that's important because the vindication of Jesus enabled him to be the perfect lamb, lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And how, do that, how does that apply to us? How should that inspire us? It should inspire us when, that when we face hostility, when we face accusations, we should trust God to vindicate us. We should follow the example of Jesus and let God, who is just, who judges justly, we should let God vindicate us. And we should respond like Jesus by trusting the Father to vindicate us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the beauty of our Lord Jesus. That he was vindicated by the Spirit. That he was proven in several ways to be the one he said he was. To be the Holy Lamb of God. To be the perfect, spotless righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that that perfect, spotless, righteous Lamb of God is our Lamb. And that all who believe in Him receive that perfect, spotless righteousness. Lord, we pray that that truth would help us to live for you in a greater way, to live a life of joy and power because the sinless Savior died and our sinful soul is count, counted free and God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Amen. Mm -hmm.